I don't envy Helen Mentha, who's going speaking last today, because of everybody who's coming before and listening to Steve, Stan, David, Kylie. I always wonder what else could I possibly have to say. You know, it 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 is um, it's a real treat, and and I'm not going to take the advice that um, that I gave to Steve, which is to not be abstract. I'm going to maybe be a little bit abstract, um, which for anyone who knows me, for me to be able to do that in 15 minutes will be a bit of a miracle. So I'm going to do the best I can to stand still and share some thoughts and ideas. So here we are, right? Here we are, sitting in this room, having our little MI geek session <laughs> in this lovely mansion, you know, hanging out on this planet <laughs> that is out here in outer space. And we're, I think, somewhere, somewhere around here, right? It goes on and on and on in an ever-expanding universe trying to figure out what the hell can we do to help people? How do we do this thing? And it seems to be human nature that what we do is we try to understand and keep moving forward and keep moving forward, whether it's what's beyond the universe or, or what's, you know, what, what, is, what, is, um, what is a black hole, you know? And the, and the astrophysicists talk in a language about time that, that it fascinates me, but I feel like I'm back at a Grateful Dead show, you know? And, and, <laughs> It, it, it blows me away. We, we look at the earth. We go down to the bottom of the ocean. We try to figure out what's down there. We try to figure out what are the elements, what are things made of. Then we turn our attention to ourselves, right? And we're amazing things, you know? And it seems to me that the more we think we know, as most Buddhists will tell you, the less you actually know, right? The whole thing about, you know, the genome, and what that seemed, and I remember sitting in a conference with Mark Shuckett years ago, and he was talking about the genetics of alcoholism. And he was saying, we were hoping that this was the key. And he said, all it does is left us more confused. It increased the amount of permeations that could possibly be happening in terms of combinations of genes. And, and we think we know, but we don't know. So I guess kind of what I get at this, and I, I come from a, the area of psychology, although you know, I don't claim that that's, that's it, but psychology is a relatively new, I dare not, I better say science because I have colleagues in here. It's <laughs> a new idea about, about how we think we do the things we do, right? The study of the self, the study of the mind. And it's based on correlations and theories and Basic statistics will tell you what. Correlation does not cause causation, right? So it's our best guess. You know, we're pretty right sometimes, but we're doing the best we can trying to figure this thing out. But the more and more we go, it seems like the less and less we know. Riding back in the taxi with, uh, with, uh, with Jody and Steve yesterday, we were talking about brief intervention, and I said, you know, I work in the alcohol and drug field. And I said, you know, it seems to me that brief interventions is about as time safe as introducing computers to work, right? The computer, they're going to say, you're going to have all this free time, all this stuff to do. And now we're doing brief interventions. And what are most clinicians on the ground complaining about? I don't have enough time. But you're doing brief intervention. But I don't have enough time. So I'm not sure how this fits in. I'm not sure how MI fits in with all that. But this is where we're, where we're at right now. We're trying to figure this out. And I think on a real fundamental level, level I'm, I'm really interested in why we as people do the things we do when we have that little thought inside of our mind that maybe we ought not do this. You know? And then we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, and we come up with reasons, and all of a sudden it becomes part of who we are, part of identity. You know? and, and In my world, people you know, will brand themselves. So I mean, it goes on and on and on and on, and we're trying to figure this thing out. And, and, and research is wonderful stuff, evidence-based, best practice, RCTs. People throw those things around like they know what they mean, and as though it, 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 it's the be-all and end-all. And it's good stuff. It's one dimension of understanding. In motivational interviewing now, we're looking at process variables, and people are pulling the language apart and change talk and 
and, and valences and strength and frequency and how do we do it and is that, and I think people have been pretty clear that it's more than just that. It's more than just a Felix a cat trick. And, and I remember Bill Miller saying years ago, you can't trick people into changing, right? It's not a gimmick. So what happens? What happens in the field? Now I've been, I've been knocking around the alcohol and drug field since about 1985, right? I came in when pop psychology was hitting it big. There's this thing that seems to happen is everybody's waiting for the next thing, right? Think about if we were having this conference in 1980. What would we be talking about? It wouldn't be motivational interviewing because Bill hadn't written the paper yet. What would be the topic of du jour? You know, take it back a little bit further. We'd be talking about primal scream. Right? Gestalt psychotherapy. I'm not saying this stuff is bad stuff. I'm just saying this is what we'd be talking about. These would be the hot things. You know, in the 80s, we might be talking about rebirthing, you know? And, and it would be the it. And then something else comes along, and then something else comes along. And one of the things that I've learned in motivational interviewing is that quite often it gets introduced, it gets some momentum, and then people are looking around, what's around that next curve? What's coming next? And it's not about competing paradigms at all. It's about taking a journey with an approach to figure out if it works. And in order to do that, you need to know how to do it, not just about it, right? But there's that urge for us to kind of push it further. You know, we'll, we'll do motivational interviewing with a twist. We'll add this. We'll add that. Well, there's a field in psychology called integration. I just call it being eclectic, but that's a, a bad word, right? That means I don't know what I'm talking about. So right now, like all things that have come to pass in the field of psychology, motivational interviewing is having a moment in time. You know? It didn't evolve out of a vacuum. Steve could easily tell us the history of motivational interviewing, the grounded theory that it stands upon. He could probably look down at his own life and look at the shoulders of the psychologists, philosophers, theorists that he's standing on that he can just see a little bit further down the road. And MI is, has a pretty good glimpse. So it's been around for a while, but it's having a moment in time. Wonder what we'll be talking about 30 years from now. Wonder if I'll be talking 30 years from now. My wife would say probably. But <laughs> the, but the, the whole thing is, is we're at a moment of time and we have an opportunity. And what we're finding out with MI is, it, is it's helpful. I've never read a study where it's hurt anybody, where people said, I'm smoking more now. I'm drinking more, you know, maybe not maybe as good as anything else or a, 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 a null effect size, but that's fine, right? We're learning about this. So, so what happens as an MI trainer and now as an MI practitioner, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in a, a, a big clinical role and I'm, I'm loving it, and is what, what I try to encourage organizations to do, which what the research tells us, and, and, and with Kylie just talked about it and what she did up in Ballarat, and what David and his team have done, and, I, and I'm so honored to have been a, a little bitty part to work with some really amazing people around, around doing this, is you don't want to jump out of one bowl just to, just to go in another one because it's bigger, because you don't know, right? Don't, don't hang out for a little while, and what that involves, and this, there's been this kind of organic emergence of people talking about organizations and culture and everything else. And, you know, Steve is really clear. This MI thing's not a panacea, but in order to see where it can take you, you have to hang out with it for a while. You have to have people within an organization who can train other people with the organization. I get the opportunity to go into places like Singapore and China and, and other places and Hong Kong and, and, and talk with people. And I've been up to Burma to work with folks. And, you know, people are like, well, give, it, give us this motivational interview and just, just tell us how to do it, right, Kylie? Just tell us how to do it. Show us the manual. And I say, why don't you learn how to do it and then put it in your own language, in your own culture, whether it's Australia or Burma, whether I'm working with Maori or Pacific people in New Zealand. Because the key is to make, to make it part of who you are, to understand how to do it, to know that you're doing it, and and my goodness, do we have some, some wonderful tools to help people learn MI, as opposed to when I read a book by these two fellows 
that I, and I looked around and said, how do I learn this thing? And I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I couldn't find anybody in a city of about 4.5 million people at the time who knew a thing about motivational interviewing. So thank goodness Bill reads his letters when you write him, you know? And, and that's what got me into this. So people don't have to scrape their training off the sidewalk anymore, right? We, we, have, a, we, have, we have data. We have data about how people learn MI. And by gosh, it's true. It takes time. It takes practice. And it takes not only intrinsic motivation from the counselor, but it takes motivation from the organization. Organizational factors are big. And so for managers and people that are in leadership positions, you need to think through whatever approach you bring on board is that you don't learn these skills by going away to a two-day workshop. You get introduced to them. As Terry Moyer says, you know, you teach them about MI, not how to do MI. Let them Here's the, here's the map, here's the compass. Go let your clients teach you how to do this and then get some feedback, right? And then you can give feedback to each other. You don't, you don't need experts around all the time. I really like it when I don't get invited back to work with organizations because they don't need me anymore, you know? Show up, give it away, and get out of the way. And what's important to do is if the vehicle's still moving, don't jump out, you know? Wait till, wait. Wait until you come to the logical journey's end. It may not be the approach for your organization, but you won't know unless you try. And you won't know whether it's going to work or not unless you can disseminate it with some fidelity, that you know you're doing it. The nice thing about MI is it's teachable. It, that people tend to enjoy it. I, I have to say, as a trainer who's done loads of workshop, I don't know if you'd say the same, Steve, or Helen, or other folks in the room, Anya, other folks in the room, I've really had no, anybody, I know David told me a story once, I've really never had anybody say, oh, this sucks, get me out of here, you know? Even if they don't want to be there, they can at least sit back and relax and enjoy it. So there's something pleasant about it that, 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 that's helpful to people. And, and a lot of, a lot, like a lot of movements within organizations and bureaucracies, it has to come from the grassroots. It's the clinicians, the people seeing the clients that have to push for change. You know, I'm, 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 I'm just in awe of the idiocracy of bureaucracies. You know, I have faith in people, but not when they sit in big departments, because it's like big corporations. You can't wait for them to change, because they, they have their own entropy that just forces them to stay still. They're good people, but big departments have a hard time making decisions sometimes. So as far as motivational interviewing goes, um, and, and, and I've been around it for, I've been around it, you know, I did my own little thing with it, trying to figure out how to do it for a few years, for about 20 years, I'd guess. Um, and, and I don't, I don't you know, I, I just kind of at a point, and I'm going to borrow something from a psychotherapist in Christchurch. Her name is Liz Muir, and she does this amazing work with, 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 with parents and moms and babies. From a, from a psychodynamic and attachment perspective, and, and her program is called Watch, Wait, and Wonder. Watch, Wait, and Wonder. And that's kind of where I'm at with, with motivational interviewing. I'm watching, I'm waiting, and I'm wondering where to from here. And, um, and, the, and it's up to y'all to take it and run with it. But let everybody know what's going on. Because I mean, I'll just encourage, as, as Steve said, the whole thing's about giving it away, giving it back, sharing it. Nobody owns it. You know, it's there. Somebody actually tried to copyright it once, but the but but the the judgment kind of was that it's just too big. It's too much. It would be like trying to copyright cognitive behavioral therapy. Right? You can't do it. It's already out there. It belongs to the people. So. So if anything, you know, if, if you're sitting here wondering from an organization perspective is to bring MI on board, it's going to take time, it's going to take energy, it's going to take a bit of money, you know, but it's going to take some champions within the organization who are ready to do the hard yards and maybe work a little extra and deal with a little bit of pushback because I'm a clinician. I don't like to learn things new sometimes, you know, we're, we're busy people, so. So anyway, I mean, that, that's what I have to offer. It's just some thoughts and just some ideas. Um, and 
hopefully in 30 years from now, some of us will be hanging out somewhere talking about motivational interviewing in its current form. So I, I thank you for your time. I thank you for, for people in here that I've worked with and had the opportunity to train with and train what you've taught me. It's, it, it's, really, it's really a gift, and I do appreciate it. Thank you.